If you're an author or plan to be one, get excited because this podcast is for you. Book Marketing Mentors is the only podcast dedicated to helping you successfully market and sell your book. If you're ready for empowering conversations with successful marketing mavens, then grab a coffee or tea and listen in to your host, international best-selling author, Susan Friedman. Welcome to Book Marketing Mentors, the weekly podcast where you learn proven strategies, tools, ideas, and tips from the masters. Every week, I introduce you to a marketing master who will share their expertise to help you market and sell more books. Today, my special guest is a customer experience expert. Jeff Tobe began an illustrious advertising career in Toronto. After that, he moved to Dallas to begin his own successful promotional agency. 25 years ago, he moved to Pittsburgh with his wife, Judy, and their two daughters to pursue a full-time speaking career. He's now spoken in 45 countries on four continents to over 100,000 people. Jeff is the author of the wildly popular book, Coloring Outside the Lines, and the co-author of three other books. His newest book, Anticipate, Knowing What Customers Need Before They Do, is one of the hottest business books on the market. Jeff believes that whatever your profession, we all share one marketing imperative. If you truly want to focus on your customer, you must see your business as your customer sees it. One of my all-time good friends and National Speaker Association colleagues, Jeff, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you to the show, and thank you for being this week's guest expert and mentor. Susan, I'm so excited to be here and honored as well. Thanks for having me. It's so wonderful to have you here. You are one of the most creative people I know. You're always thinking of new ways to approach this business. And obviously now with the way things are, you really have to get super creative. What are you doing that's creative at the moment? Well, it's funny. I, I'm doing a lot of webinars, a lot of online things that and not necessarily for pay. <laughs> you know, right now, I just want to serve my customer. And I, I think that's what it's all about and what we do. I just uh, did a webinar today. As a matter of fact, we had 60 dentists on the line. And I don't know about uh, New York. I know you're in New York, but in Pennsylvania, where I am, dentists have been forbidden to open their offices, even for emergencies. So they've got to get creative. And I don't think that there's any one profession or industry that's not being affected including ours, the speaking and publishing industry. I'm just trying to look at my business. And again, like you said, and thank you. I, I love the introduction because it really is about seeing the world through their eyes, not ours. I once heard a sales trainer say, if you see the world through your customer's eyes, you'll see the way your customer buys. And I, I love that. I just take that to heart. And that's really what I'm doing right now is trying to look at my business from my customer's perspective. And I know that you've said to help your clients, you have to put on their glasses, your customer glasses to create a meaningful change. And doing these webinars now, you're right, we're giving stuff away. And that's what they say we need to be doing because it's going to be over. We want people to remember who we are and what we're known for. And if we give it away now, hey, Hopefully, we'll have people come back to us when it's time to buy. So Absolutely. And, and you know, it, it all comes back. It's full circle. <laughs> You've got to give to receive. And yeah. what a wonderful opportunity to give. We've got so much that we can give. You started your business where you gave up an illustrious career and just to go full time into speaking what was I thinking? Eh? What were you thinking? <laughs> hey? <laughs> exactly. Knowing your wife, I'm like, okay, I wonder the, what she was thinking. Oh, my goodness. What's he going to do now? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? I was fortunate because I really didn't jump into the speaking and writing arena. I kind of eased into it. And that was kind of nice. I had my own marketing and promotions firm. And I had a great staff that allowed me to go out and kind of play at speaking for a while. Unlike a lot of people who have to make that decision quickly, I, I took about two years transition. Would you recommend that for our authors who are wanting to go into speaking? What would you recommend as a transition for them? Oh, absolutely. First of all, 
a blatant plug. I coach emerging speakers kind of to shorten that runway to get into the business. What I found is that too many people want to make the leap too quickly. I refer back always to my experience. I, I went at the time to a meeting of the North Texas Speakers Association in Dallas, where I was living at the time. And the speaker that day coincidentally just happened to be a guy by the name of Zig Ziglar. I went up to him afterwards and I said, Mr. Ziglar, I want to do what you do. And he said, Jaya, because apparently in the South, my name has two syllables. <laughs> but he said, he said, Jaya, he said, uh, become a celebrity in your own business. I said, what does that mean? He said, what do you do? I said, I'm in the promotions and marketing profession. He said, become the go-to person in that profession for something. That when they think of a trainer, speaker, they come to Jeff Tobe. And he said, eventually, somebody's going to come to you and say, you know, my wife works for IBM and they really need to hear the same message. And it'll start to blossom from there. And he was absolutely right. So I took almost two years. I was speaking all the time, but mostly within my profession. What Zig recommended is literally what, as you know, I've been preaching for so long, and that mm -hmm. is find that niche market where you can become the authority, the expert, and don't worry about anything else. You did what he said, and yeah. hey, well, look. But I've learned, I've learned so much from you as well. With <laughs> I, I focus, when I'm coaching, I, I'm focusing all the time on, you know, where do you have the most credibility right now? It's so often in the industry that you've come out of or you're still in, don't ignore your expertise, your experience, because that counts for a lot and gives you enormous credibility in that market. Yeah, I had a potential speaker just today I was talking to on the phone who was very disillusioned about getting into the speaking business right now. And I understand that. I actually think this is an opportunity as well. I'm seeing so many, not cancellations as much as just postponements. So the fall and, and the first quarter of next year are going to be busy for speakers. And especially if you stay in the limelight, give them some value now. Give something away. Exactly. Just help to train their people free for a little bit. Because mm -hmm. then when they really do need you, then hopefully, as we said, they'll pay you for that because exactly. you've you got to stand out from the crowd. Yeah. Let's talk about how you've used and you continue to use, obviously, your books to promote your business or where they fit into your business. Talk to us about that. My books are a huge part of my business, as you know, and, and being a speaker, back of the room sales is obviously one avenue we speakers have to promote and, and sell our products. My book especially has been just wonderful. Coloring Outside the Lines, first of all, I, I kind of stumbled across the brand of Coloring Outside the Lines many years ago, as you know. It was the name of one of my talks, and I was walking through, I'll never forget, Detroit Airport, and a guy stopped me and he said, I know you, you're the Coloring Outside the Lines guy. And he had no idea what my name was, couldn't remember where he had heard me. So I said, you know, I gotta do something about that. And that's when I branded Coloring Outside the Lines. It was also the, obviously the title of my first book. I hate to admit that's almost uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, Susan, that I wrote that book. And it was wonderfully successful at the time. But you know what happens in a lifetime of a book. And a quick story, if I can. If Absolutely. Okay. I was asked to speak at an event here in Pittsburgh where I live. Very small event at very little fee on a Saturday morning. <laughs> And I, I actually told the woman who I've known for many years, I said, I just can't do it. And uh, she called me about two weeks later and said, you, you've got to do it. I can't find anybody else. And in a moment of weakness, I said, OK, you know, so what do we do? We, we, if, it doesn't matter what we get paid. We, we're, gonna, we're true professionals. We do the best job that we can. And I spoke that Saturday morning. And afterwards, all these chapters of this association, it's an international association, but all the local chapters came out to me and asked me to come and speak. And I said, let's wait till Monday. Well, the first phone call I got from Monday was the, uh, someone from the International Association. And they said to me, we had somebody in the audience on Saturday that heard you speak. We'd like to create a keynote for you at our annual convention with 1,800 attendees. She said, what are your fees? Well, I told her my fees. 
And and she, I heard her say, "Oh, I thought you were going to tell me fifty thousand dollars." <laughs> and and you know, as, as, as true salespeople that we are, sometimes or marketing people in our minds, all I could hear for the rest of the conversation was fifty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. And at the end of the conversation, I hesitated, but I I said, Michelle, I said, "What if I write a book just for your industry?" And she said, "Jeff, it, it, the conference is six weeks away." I said, "I know." But if I can write a book, would you give me a book signing after my presentation? She said, of course. I said to her, who's the number one person who's probably speaking in the industry, but is actually a person from your industry, but isn't a professional speaker? Without hesitation, she gave me a name. I hung up with her. I called the gentleman she told me to in, in Michigan. I said, you don't know me? And he said, yes, I do. I was in your uh, audience on Saturday in Pittsburgh. <laughs> He said, I said, we're going to write a book together. He said, oh, that sounds great. He said, I said, and it has to be done in two weeks. And there was total silence. <laughs> he said, oh, Jeff, I'm just too busy. I couldn't do it in two weeks. I said, no, you can. Here's what I'd like you to do. Take my book, Coloring Outside the Lines. And after each chapter, I just want you to write a few paragraphs on how that chapter applies specifically to your profession. Well, he did it. We did it. You know, obviously, I invested in a new cover and a new layout, but we had a new book. And when I called the association to tell them that it was it was ready, she bought uh, 2,000 copies right off the bat. And I don't mind saying it's that was for project managers. So the title of the book became Project Management Professionals Are Coloring Outside the Lines. Well, since then, I've done four others. So I have five books in the last couple of years just reinventing coloring outside the lines. I have promotional products professionals are coloring outside the lines. I just wanted to tell the story because for those people that have had a book for a while, there are ways to reinvent it. Absolutely brilliant. And you never know who's in the audience. Yes. Exactly. It, it, and let me just say that since that time, I have spoken to 42 chapters worldwide. I've been to 16 countries and they've paid well. So you never know. You're exactly right. Yes. Never turn anything down because, as you say, you never know what's going to come out of it because that's a brilliant story. Oh, I thanks. love it. Yes. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun <laughs> and, and I'm looking forward to continue doing it. Well, and I think the really creative part of this, and that is that you took this book and you reinvented it and made it pertinent to those particular industries and people love it right. when and something's been customized for right. them. And to be honest with you, Susan, I don't do a lot of work. <laughs> the other person does it, right? I, my book is written and it that really doesn't change. It's really the paragraphs after each cha chapter. I know that my first book, the Exhibiting at Trade Shows, Tips and Techniques for Success, we customized the cover for a couple of companies and then had the president write a letter and that went in the inside page yeah. and the rest of the book was exactly the same, yeah. but it had a cover on it that was just for this particular company Absolutely. and they were able to give it out to their customers or their prospects. But now with, with print on demand, it's different, right? We can... We can change the inside anytime we want. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. fairly small quantities, depending on how they're printing their books. So, yeah, they, they get creative with it. You yeah. have to get creative because that's the only way you can go. So talk to us about your new book, The Anticipate, knowing what customers need before they do. Yeah, you know, it's funny because you and I have talked about this. I, I've kind of gone the other route with that book. And that was with John Wiley, a traditional publisher. And a whole different experience. I think it may have been, in retrospect, a bit of an ego thing because, you know what, I never fooled myself and thought I would be famous with one of my books or a bestseller. You have to ask yourself, why am I writing a book? Or why did I write a book? I don't know what happened, but I wanted to try the traditional route. And it's a great book. I co-authored it. And uh, besides the advance that we got from... John Wiley. I don't think we'll ever see another penny from it. <laughs> so it's been a uh, an interesting ride. I'll say that. And I think that's why I'm, I mean, I'm blatantly pro self-publishing now, <laughs> especially for uh, speakers. I think 
and maybe you can answer this better than anyone, but I think you can still self-publish a book and get noticed by a traditional publisher down the road. Is that true still? Very much so. If you sell enough of them, then a publisher will take notice. However, you're right. It's like, why? Because it won't be for the money. It yeah. could be more for the ego than it would be for the money. Now, a couple of my books, are, I'm still getting royalties from them and they're... I know 15 years old, especially my dummies book, and I'm still getting royalties, but I can't retire on that kind of money. But still, <laughs> what's nice is, and I think something that's important is that if it's an evergreen subject, it's got much more longevity than something that is trendy at the moment. What are your thoughts on that? No, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm in the customer experience arena, and it's a fairly new, well, I say fairly new. I, one of the first uh, real popular books in my area was a book called The Experience Economy, and that was in 1999. That's what really turned my focus from customer service and creativity to customer experience. But you're absolutely right. Could you imagine being in the technology world and writing a book? <laughs> I can't imagine how quickly that changes. So <laughs> before so, it even gets out on the shelves, probably. <laughs> exactly. So we're fortunate. We're, I, I, you know, we're fortunate. We have topics that that really do give lessons that are timeless. I, I will share with you that I just did a presentation before all this started uh, last month on communication skills, and I was quoting a book that I realized was written in 1977. And I really questioned myself after I said it. And after I ate my talk, I came home and I, I looked at the book and I realized that it's on listening. Talk about an evergreen subject, right? It can't change. <laughs> listening is listening in 1977 or 2020. We kind of have to look at our topics and ask ourselves, is it an evergreen topic? You talked about Zig Ziglar earlier and his books are still selling well. He probably also wrote them the same time period and maybe even before that. I wouldn't discourage people from writing on topics that aren't evergreen. You know, if it's a hot topic, then just be prepared that maybe 15 years from now, we may have to rewrite or write something else. Maybe not even that long. Right. Let's, let's talk about mistakes that either you've made and you say you're working with emerging speakers. What are some of the things that you caution them about? Oh, I don't make any mistakes, so it must be somebody else. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I think, and you and I have talked about this, I think one of my biggest mistakes in my mind was jumping too quickly. You know, I've since learned that the saying that the opposite to perfect is done, <laughs> and I am more on the done side than I am on perfection, <laughs> and always have been, you know me. But I've rushed to market, and that's probably a huge mistake. Like you, I have a few anthologies to my name, and if people don't know what that is, it's when you bring different authors together for the same subject. My first one was called The Sales Coach. I wanted to get into a more of a sales arena, I thought, uh, very early on in my career, and realized that I didn't have enough material to write a book, but I was an expert in one area of sales. So I went out and looked for experts in other areas of sales and got them to write their own chapters. But I rushed to market and it wasn't a great book. You know, you still have to be proud of your book. I wasn't overly proud of it. And, I, and then, of course, I can't learn my lesson. So I, I think I did uh, uh, at least another one before I thought, I've got to slow down a little bit. I think the biggest mistake is don't rush it, but don't go for perfection as well. What do you find with your authors? They procrastinate a lot because it either isn't perfect or they're frightened sometimes to put their toe in the water because of what that might do for them. There's that fear of judgment and criticism out there in the marketplace. So I think a lot of them hold themselves back. Have you found that with any of yeah. your emerging speakers? No, absolutely. And they not only did they hold themselves back, but it's almost the corollary to that. Sometimes speakers have written books on topics that aren't marketable as a speaker. I should say emerging speakers. So they've written this book and it may be uh, controversial. And I have to ask yourself, is my topic marketable? And it's also a mistake that I've seen that people will just jump in because they're passionate about something, but it doesn't mean it's marketable. And 
fortunately or unfortunately, that's the way I think, as you know. I mean, I'm a marketing guy. That's how my mind works. My first question is, yes, you might be a great speaker, but is it marketable? Because you have to look at what do people want. And even if you specialize within a certain niche market, you need to know and understand what that niche market needs. Mm -hmm. And can you deliver on that? Have you got solutions that you can offer them? Because that's when they're going to come to you. And that's when you start creating that authority, that expert authority, where you become the go-to person. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like to emphasize with uh, the authors who work with me. The topic itself, I had a young lady who came to me a few years ago, and she had written a book on abortion and wanted to get out speaking about it. And we had took a long look at it. And, you know, it doesn't matter where your politics lie, <laughs> or where your, your feelings lie. Is it marketable? And she, we didn't work together. She decided to sort of step back and reevaluate. But I recently saw her at a meeting, a local meeting of our NSA chapter, the National Speakers Association. And I was surprised to see her. I hadn't seen her in years. And, and she's out speaking full time. And I said, that's great. But what are you speaking about? And she said, I speak about making choices. And she said that to me was the translation into, you know, sort of the corporate speaking world. And I really think that was wonderful because she took a look at her topic, which is really what that was about, but it was just very too narrowly focused to be marketable as well. Sometimes that's all it takes. It's just sort of pivoting that message so that it's more acceptable yeah. to the marketplace. Yeah. It, this isn't even a mistake, but it just occurred to me. If you've been watching the news, which we have a lot of us, uh, especially in these crazy times in which we're living, every interview with every expert out of their home, what's behind them? Almost 90% of the time. Do you know? Books. Yes. It's a bookshelves. I'm so self-centered, Susan, that I'm looking for my book on their shelves all the time. <laughs> it's really a bad thing. But, but the bottom line is that people are reading. We really have to encourage people to keep writing. Either that or they just like to make it look as if they do. And so sure, they've got sure. lots of books on their bookshelf. <laughs> That's true too. But I want to believe that uh, people are reading books. I don't want to burst that bubble for you. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff, tell our listeners more about your services, your emerging speaker program. Thanks. How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, it's really simple. It's just jeff at jefftobe.com is my email address. Reach out to me. As you know, in what you do uh, in the book business, everything is customized. <laughs> it depends on what somebody needs. I get speakers at all levels. I don't work on sp with speakers on their presentation skills. My assumption is that when you come to me, you already know and you're pretty good at speaking. But what I do is it's more about shortening the runway of getting into the speaking business. How do I market myself? Where do I look for new business? What tools do I need in marketing? Again, it's just jeff at jefftobe.com. My website is simply jefftobe.com. And I would love to have a conversation. Even if we don't end up working together, I'm always open for conversations for emerging speakers. And Jeff is such a creative person, people, that just speaking to him, the ideas just flow. So do take advantage, get in touch and check out what he can do to help you. And Jeff, if you were to leave our listeners with a golden nugget, what would that be? When you asked me that, the first thing I thought of was an old movie. <laughs> do you ever see the movie Harvey? Yes. Like Jimmy Stewart? Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, just uh, that movie, I watched it as a kid and I took it at face value, very entertaining. And at the beginning of the movie, they want to commit Jimmy Stewart's character to a mental institution. I mean, he's obviously crazy. He's the only one who can see this invisible six foot white rabbit that he's named Harvey. And so maybe 10 years ago, I rented it to watch with my daughters. And for some reason, I watch it from a whole different perspective. And like I say, they want to commit his character to a mental institution, but Watching from a different perspective, I started to question whether or not he was the crazy one. Just maybe it was everybody who couldn't see Harvey who was crazy. And so I kind of have always had this theory that I want to leave your listeners with, and it's this. We have to learn to see invisible opportunities where everyone else sees only visible limitations. 
Let me say that again. We have to learn to see invisible opportunities where everyone else says it can't be done. Where everyone else says, you know, I tried that once, it doesn't work. Where everyone else says, you can't do that in this profession. I think that's where the opportunities lie. And that's how we have to train our brains. And that couldn't be more appropriate than now with looking at the world from a whole different perspective. And there are lots of opportunities out there. We just have to see things differently. Great message. Jeff, you're brilliant. I love you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And thank you all for taking time out of your precious day to listen to this interview. And I sincerely hope that it sparked some ideas you can use to sell more books. Here's wishing you much book marketing success. The time is now to take action and finally build your book selling empire. And the great news is that Susan is here to help you. Visit bookmarketingmentors.com and sign up for a free 15-minute book marketing strategy session with Susan. She'll help you discover your first steps to marketing and selling your book. Only those who take action are rewarded. So visit bookmarketingmentors.com and we'll see you again next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.